we really don't understand the specific needs of the developing child. I mean, your body and your brain are forming right then. Hi everyone, and welcome to another episode of Hashtag Food Truth, where we will be talking all things food with incredible experts from how food impacts our health, our environment, and our behaviors. I'm your co-host, Sharon Krein, attorney turned food nerd. And I'm your co-host, Dr. Kevin Lyon, family medicine physician and the co-founder of the anti AGEs Foundation. And today we will be talking about childhood malnutrition, the facts, the consequences, and a path to the solution. Today's guest is Sharmin Russell. Charmin is an award-winning nature and science author. Her work focuses on areas that she is passionate about conveying to the world, from archaeology to hunger. Her most recent novel is titled Within Our Grasp, Childhood Malnutrition Worldwide and the Revolution Taking Place to End It. This book sheds light on the extremely important issue of childhood malnourishment and its relevance to every citizen in every country. Charmin, thank you so much for being here today. Happy to be here. Awesome. So I'd love to start out if you could kind of, you know, for everybody listening who may not really understand what malnutrition is, if you could give a definition, that would be amazing. Well, it's also called undernutrition and then there's overnutrition, but I think I'll talk about undernutrition. And I think a form of malnutrition that many people aren't aware of is called stunting. So when you see those children in times of war and famine and they're skeletal and those two bright eyes, uh, those children are malnourished and what we call wasted. They're too thin. They absolutely need food and nutrients right now. Uh, and they're about 7% of the world's children are wasted. It's a horrible term um, and, and in danger. But stunting means that in the first five years of life, and that starts in the womb, uh, the developing brain, the developing body is not getting the, the nutrients, the food that it needs to grow. And so there's a period of faltered growth. And, and then you have a child under the age of five, too short for her age. And that is shorthand for this range of problems as an adult and as a child. Uh, there's cognitive problems, there's emotional problems, there's physical problems. It's kind of a lifetime of diminished potential. So that's, that's kind of what undernutrition, its main manifestations, whether you become too thin and you really start cannibalizing yourself, your own body for nutrients, or becoming stunted at a period of faltered growth where it affects the rest of your life that you you weren't able to achieve uh, physically and mentally what what you were kind of meant to do, what you were programmed to do in normal nourishment. Okay, so um, as a family medicine physician, could you maybe discuss um, what people or patients would would likely see, you know, if they are in that category of undernourished or, or malnourished, what are the outcomes or detriments that can occur later in life, uh, maybe even in terms of chronic disease or, or developmental deficiencies? Right. Well, for the stunted child, if, if you're, and again, we're talking about under the age of five, which is normally when that falter growth happens and stunting happens, there's immediate consequences. You're doing less well in school. Uh, you might be more anxious. You might, you might be depressed. So, so there's what happens to you as a child. Later on in adult, uh, you're more susceptible to maybe problems in your immune system. You're going to be more at risk for heart disease and for stroke and sadly for obesity, uh, for diabetes. So your entire systems have been um, affected as an adult and you're just prone to a lot more chronic disease, as you say. And I guess the, you know, most people probably think of Malnutrition is something that's really distant from them, but can you actually speak to the, the numbers of children that suffer from malnutrition on, on both sides, the, the over and the under? Right, right. Um, you know, worldwide, it's it, it can seem overwhelming because we think 22% of children under the age of five are stunted. That's a quarter, almost a quarter of our world's generation who have lost, you know, their potential. Uh, to some extent. And then again, maybe 7% of children wasted with 2% extreme wasting. 
you know, here in the United States and here in wealthy countries, we, we don't even measure stunting and wasting uh, because we don't have that problem to a large degree. However, I, I'm really struck that the CDC believes that about 15% of pregnant women in America are iron deficient and about 15% of toddlers are iron deficient. And iron is enormously important for neurological development. So when you have, um, when you think of how many learning disabilities we have experienced in our classrooms, and you think of 15% of our toddlers and uh, pregnant women uh, deficient in iron, then you think, no, we have problems too. And, and we see them too in, in anxious children and in depressed children. Again, malnourishment isn't just about a physical uh, you know, consequence that you can see. It's, it's, it's so much bigger than that. Yeah. And I think that that's kind of one of the, the misconceptions that we see, you know, in, in, especially in the U S obviously where we're a country, we have access to so many resources and over, you know, access, um, is that we really, you know, when we think of malnutrition, like you said, we kind of think of, you know, the, the eighties and the nineties where we would see the commercials of, you know, the starving children in Africa. And that, and that's just the, that's just what we think. Like, you know, mm -hmm. that's, that's starvation yes. and, and that's malnutrition. But on a large scale, you know, we mo we know most humans are deficient in, in essential nutrients that they need every day. So it really is a it's a human race issue across the board. But when it comes to you know childhood malnutrition, it's a completely different and much more severe issue because that first one thousand day window, if if a child is deficient in any one of these nutrients or a range of these nutrients it affects them for the rest of their life and their irreversible damage can be caused. And so it's, it's really, you know, I think as a society a failure to understand what the true real implications are, if we don't take this seriously. Um, and so I'd love to, if you could kind of shed some light on, you know, how you got into this and what's your experience with childhood malnutrition and, and the communities that you've worked with. Okay. Well, I might digress a little bit uh, by saying, you know, I first became interested in childhood malnutrition uh, when I became a mother in 1984. So, uh, you know, when you're a mother of children and you're breastfeeding, there's a certain aggrandizement. You become the mother of all children and you feel you're feeding all children. And I, I think as a young woman, it just baffled me that children, other children were dying for lack of food. You know, I had so much to give my children. So I became very interested in that subject. Uh, I'm a writer. I didn't write about it for some time. My publisher said, that's a little grim. We don't, we, you know, we're not interested in a book. And this was in the 20th century. So I wrote another book called Hunger and a Natural History. And that was more about the science of hunger, uh, voluntary hunger, as well as involuntary hunger. There were a few chapters in there about childhood malnutrition. But I met some very interesting people in writing that book. This was in about 2005. And, you know, X number of years later, I wanted to know what progress they had made. And what I discovered is that really in the 20th century, uh, I have to admit, my editor had me use the word revolution, but it's really true. It's really in the 21st century that everything has kind of come together so that we finally know what to do. We were doing a lot of trial and error after World War II and for the next, you know, 50 years. But now we do have this uh, ready to use therapeutic food that we can give to severely malnourished children. And it's very precisely fortified. So it really has exactly what they need to recover. And we're seeing miraculous recoveries. But I think as much as important, we now understand that we need this holistic approach. We know that it doesn't work, you know, to solve a, a child's problem right, right in that moment. If you're not also empowering the woman in the home to continue to keep that child, you know, nour nourished. If you're not encouraging breastfeeding, if you don't have clean water, if you don't have clean sanit, if you don't have good sanitation, if you're not protecting from disease and, and parasites that contribute to malnourishment. So we now have this holistic approach. We have proven strategies. We have this ready to use therapeutic food. It's like we're ready to go. You know, we're ready to solve this problem. And I have to say that this is what drew me to writing a book about it. If it had been kind of this, oh, it's so sad and it's hopeless, you know, my publishers were right. 
that's too grim. Um, and, 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 and hope, hopelessness doesn't generate action. What's, what's the point of writing about that? But now I really am infused with hope, uh, after seeing these communities, you know, that, and I can talk about that a little bit too, but, but I really just wanted to say that, that my approach to doing this was about looking at successful programs, going into communities that were working, that had found ways of dealing with malnutrition. And um, so, and I found them and I found them uh, and I chose deliberately to go to one of the poorest countries in the world, Malawi, because uh, Malawi also has a great history with malnutrition. It's done some seminal work in, in the research. And so I went there, they have high, stunting rates, or they had, because their programs are, are just steadily working to make things better. So, should I tell you about some yeah, of those you, communities? Can, <laughs> yes, absolutely, please, because your your book goes into detail about your experience, you know, in Malawi, and um, I think that that's, it, it's always kind of ranking as one of the, the poorest countries in the world, it's usually in the top 10 range, um, but the amount of your book kind of sheds the amount of work that is going on and the hope and, and all of the resources that are going to not only build up the, the children and get them the right nutrition, but also the families and the communities and what that means, because it is, it's, it's the whole, the whole network, the whole economy that you know, is going to support a healthy child that grows up to be a healthy adult. So can you, yeah, please shed some light on, on your experience. Yeah. There. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I'll tell you about two. One was, uh, I, I saw many of them. One was something called Soils, Food, and Healthy Communities. And so this program, and you know, everywhere I went, there were these vital, strong uh, Malawian women who were kind of taking me places and telling me what to do and showing me, you know, how to do it. So they were really in charge. So they wanted to um, decrease childhood malnutrition by making the farmer more prosperous mostly through diverse crops, drought tolerant crops, uh, using um, uh, organic fertilizer instead of expensive fertilizer. So they wanted to make that smallholder farmer more prosperous. And so they did that uh, through a lot of programs. And then after a few years, they checked to see if childhood malnutrition had decreased and it hadn't that much. And they asked the women, how's it going? They said, well, not so good, really. Um, you know, all this new agricultural technique is making our work harder. Uh, we have all the care for the children. We have all the care for cleaning. We have all the care for cooking and we have all the care for ch children and we have half the gardening and the farming responsibilities. And we're exhausted. You know, uh, uh, we talk so easily about exclusive breastfeeding, that mothers should exclusively breastfeed, that's pretty hard to do when you're exhausted. It's pretty hard to do when you're uh, too tired to even feed yourself properly. So the program leader said, well, you know, what can we do? And they started doing these home visits. And the woman said, well, these aren't working either. You know, the men are just disappearing. As soon as they see you come, you know, suddenly they're, they're gone. So the women, the women, the villagers themselves said, let's do something public and let's do something celebratory. And so they started having these public cooking days um, in which, you know, uh, they would have contests about who was doing the best recipe and who could cook the best. And they started bringing the men in and they were dancing and singing and no one wants to miss a party. And that's what was happening. So this took us some time and they had community theater where they would talk about their relationships. So it was slow, but men and women started talking to each other and they started talking about what was best, as, as you say, Sharon, for the whole family. So that was a really wonderful community visit. There's lots of clapping and singing and dancing and, and, and you know, success. Um, but I'll say too, that I also went to a number of the clinics and where uh, a woman maybe was diagnosed as being malnourished, maybe she was pregnant, or she had children who were malnourished at a home clinic, uh, a village clinic. And then she would walk maybe an hour, maybe two hours to a larger clinic where she would get her packets of ready to use therapeutic food. And this is a national program Malawi has. They're just giving out this important necessary food. So you'd go to these clinics and of course there would be you know, a hundred women and children there. And you can imagine, you know, you know, the kind of joy and the, you know, laughter and, and what happens when you get, you know, a lot of children together. But there was also uh, fear and there was also shame. You know, it's pretty shameful for a mother to have 
a malnourished child. You feel it's your fault. You feel you did something wrong. Um, and I remember, so that's the other side of it, you know, and I, I remember uh, there was a teenage, uh, she seemed young, teenage mother, uh, and, and the woman, the nurse who was doing uh, some of the evaluation said, oh, you wait right over here. Just wait right by this truck. As soon as the clinic's over, we're taking you and the baby to the hospital. She's so anemic. She needs a blood transfusion right away. And I just remember the fear on that woman's face and on that young mother's face. And I remember when uh, I had, you know, my daughter as a newborn got diagnosed with something was put in the hospital. And I just remember leaning over her crib saying, I'll do anything, I'll do anything for you. So it was very moving. And I think those are the connections you make when you go to um, you know, a situation like that. In this case, this mother was gonna be taken to the hospital. Her baby was gonna get a transfusion. Um, so, so that was a good thing. I have yeah, other I guess stories. I <laughs> yeah, no, but I'm. That's I enough. I, I, I can't even imagine. But, yeah. <laughs> I guess with with everything that you've learned and all of your experiences, uh, what would you say like the biggest misconception about malnutrition might be, at least in the United States? Well, I think uh, globally, it, it, it is that is the idea of stunting that, as, as we talked about that that you just fix the problem then and, and then that's okay. But actually, if you've allowed stunting to happen, it's not that fixable. You, you can't often regain what's lost. But here in the United States, you know, I think we still don't understand enough about vitamins and minerals. I mean, let's remember that we didn't understand that, you know, global researchers until the end of the last century. I mean, they came up with this ready-to-use therapeutic food in refeeding malnourished children in the 1990s, you know, just, you know, 20 odd years ago. And, and they were amazed at how successful it was. Um, so here in America too, you know, we, we depend a lot on processed food. Uh, we depend a lot on food that is not that nutritious. And we too, and this is true in, in developing countries too, we really don't understand the specific needs of the developing child. I mean, your body and your brain are forming right then. Uh, you know, it's it's not like you or I would suddenly be deprived of zinc or iron or 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 vitamin A, and we would see the consequences. You know, if we didn't get vitamin C, we might get scurvy. If we didn't get this, we would we would see consequences. But those consequences in the young child are so much more severe and long lasting. Uh, so you don't have the building blocks that that create you as as a healthy body. So I don't I don't think we understand uh, that well enough. And I think that's one of the things if we don't, if the experts in the medical community are still trying to figure it out and still trying to understand and how to articulate that, it's almost even more difficult when you look to the parent and you are trying to either educate them or you're trying to give them the tools I feel like just being, just handing somebody, you know, something and saying, eat this, you know, you need this versus giving them the education and the tools with it um, can make a big difference. Can you kind of speak to your opinion on that? Is it, do you, you know, is it crucial to have a 50-50 or what's the importance on educating along with the, with the, um, you know, the yeah. actual ready to eat food? Yeah, I think one of the things that surprised me in Malawi, and I know it's true all over uh, the world, is how much education was a part of this. It, it wasn't just opportunity and it wasn't just resources. So a lot of uh, uh, village people, smallholder farmers, traditional people all over, they some of them, many of them have access to diverse diets as adults. You know, so they have a little bit of vegetable relish. They have some stews they might have in, in the evening. They might, you know, they'll eat an egg. They'll put in some goat's meat. They'll have nuts. You know, they have bananas. So so their diets as adults can be diverse. But there's a tradition in feeding young children this kind of bland cornmeal, this kind of bland porridge. Mm -hmm. And we know children like bland food. <laughs> you know, you, you're always trying to get your child to eat something, you know, a little diverse, you know, you know, orange carrots, and they don't want to do that. It's so, so this is a matter of education. 
that yes, put in some nuts, put in some soy milk, give them a banana. They have small stomachs, feed them more than, you know, twice a day. That And that education is going on and it's Malawian women teaching Malawian women. And of course, Malawian parents teaching Malawian parents. Um, and that's important. And we know here in the United States too, um, it's too easy to, to, to look, you know, to look at convenient food, to look at food that's maybe fast food, uh, sweets. I mean, we have so much compelling, addictive food around us. That's one of our problems is that, is that, you know, those candy bars are really good. <laughs> and, and, and those, those potato chips have been designed to make you want to eat more and more. And so we have, that's a real challenge for us to, to get children to like more nutritious food. It takes our own education uh, and a lot. And I think that's what we're going through right now is we're kind of seeing that it is even today in, in you know 2022, we are still learning and we're still, you know, even in America and, and, and um, you know, countries similar to America as parents, we actually aren't, aren't taught the severity of what it even means to give a child the proper nutrition in this, in this window and what it means psychologically, you know, emotionally, what are we, what are we setting our child up for and versus, you know, the, 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 the scientific side. It's, there's so much, you know, lack of education, even though we seem educated and there's so many options everywhere, there really is a, a huge, you know, gap there. And I think one of the big things is, now we're reaping the consequences of that, which is the opposite of undernourishment and and stunting, and that's overweight. Um, so can we kind of transition to overweight in that form of malnutrition? Because it, sure. it is, and it has been increasing to a level where now it, it may be even more than undernutrition. It is, it is. You know, when I wrote Hunger and the Natural History in 2004, the World Health Organization didn't even talk about overweight or obesity. It wasn't even part of their malnourishment. Now it very definitely it is. Uh, being overweight or obese is definitely seen as a form of malnourishment. And it's not increasing just in, in the wealthy countries. It's actually a double burden of nutrition, overnutrition and undernutrition in poor countries. Because as it turns out, um, being undernourished as a child uh, can lead to obesity as an adult. And um, we see that in the United States as, as well as uh, in developing countries. In the United States, it's a different situation. Our undernourishment as children tends not to be, again, wasting or stunting. But we do have one in six children in the United States are food insecure. So these children don't know when their next meal will be. During the pandemic here in New Mexico, where I live, it, it was one in three children were at risk of being food insecure. That's, that's, that's our children. That's a lot of children. And yeah. I, think, I think there's a big emotional and psychological cost to that, as well as a physical one. Children who go to school hungry, children who don't know where their next meal will be, are obviously doing less well in school. They're obviously going to be sick more often. There's obviously going to be physical but I think also just emotionally, knowing that you live in such a wealthy country, which is not taking care of you. And um, so they also, as you know, off, uh, poor children often live in food deserts. So the only thing surrounding them for them and their parents is cheap, convenient fast food, is the kind of thing, you know, you go into a, a, a gas station market and you're just surrounded by, by glitter, glittery, wonderful, bad food. Um, so, so they don't have access to fresh vegetables and, and fruits and the kinds of, of, of food that, you know, their children, you know, sometimes need. So poverty, uh, is is part of malnourishment here in terms of of being overweight and obese um and and so of course is our whole culture around food to some extent so i i guess it's it's difficult because you know when, when i have these these patients who are very clearly um you know in a lower socioeconomic class and and very clearly live in a, in a food desert and i know that they're really not you know giving nutritious food for their children um, it's it's tough, you know. I can I can educate them and, and try to tell them to do the right things, but you, you know, usually there's there's really not many options for them um, or something that you know they're merely maybe not willing to do. 
um, or have uh, access to really. Um, do you have any recommendations or, or what are your opinions on, on what we should be telling our families and patients who, who live in these food deserts who are just used to eating this way? Yeah, yeah. Well, I, I do want to start by saying what I think we should be telling our politicians and our leaders, which is uh, we should give these people more choices. You know, we owe that to them to do child uh, tax credits and to do a better system of public assistance. Um, I, I think it's shameful that that a wealthy country doesn't just ensure that all its children, you know, have enough food, no matter their socioeconomic class. So first, I would do a little rant and a, you know, a demand of of our leadership. Uh, but here they are, you know, you're stuck in a food desert, and and it's not changing right now. I, it would be glib of me to to try and give advice. I guess I would go back to what you know, Sharon, and you're saying too is is education and say, you know what, this is so important. If you're pregnant and you have a, a small child, take the extra bus ride, you know, um, you know, do whatever you need to do because this is a window of time that, that your children need uh, these nutrients. And, um, you know, I, I'm, I'm kind of, speechless in the sense that it's so unfair to have to tell these parents, you have to take the long bus ride. You know, you have to, you know, go to the, the food pantry. I work at our local food pantry and I have for a long time and I know it's hard. You know, you show up to get your food at the food pantry and I'm there helping and the truck's two hours late and you're hanging out for two hours. And so it's not easy to, to get assistance here and it's not easy to to deal with living in a food desert. I think at this point, all we can tell them it's worth the effort. And I think one of the things that you mentioned before is how can we, how can we kind of explain to parents that it's worth it? And I think that that uh -huh. it's worth it is, is parents really knew that because like you said, when you were standing, you know, above, above your child's crib, it's, it's very much, I'll, I'll do anything. If I know I'll that the, the, the consequences are that right. extreme, I'll do anything. And, right. and I truly believe that every single parent feels the same way. But I think if, if we don't know how severe the damage really could be, then that two hour extra wait time or that extra effort of, you know, making the homemade meals and not going through McDonald's drive through or grabbing a big bag of chips or something that is, seems like, you know, more food for the dollar in that moment, it's not going to, it's not going to be enough. So it's, it's, to me, it's, it's really our, you know, our leadership, our communities have to do a better job, really painting the picture as, as sad as it is to let parents know that if, if they don't get this food, then, you know, they're not going to be able to thrive. And by th not thriving, you know, that breaks every parent's heart. That's kind of an immediate, okay. you know, they're not going to be a smart they're not going to be as physically, you know, able. Yeah. Um, it's going to set them back on every single level of their life. And I think that that's one of the things, you know, growing up in a food desert myself, like my mom, we, we would have to take the bus and we'd have, to, you know, our cart that, and it would take a long time to go and get the food. And, and a lot of people, you know, if, I think if my mom knew that extra, like how severe it would be, instead of it just being another option, and it's a necessity, I think that that would really shift the mindset of a lot of parents, you know, for sure, because every parent yeah. wants what's best for their kid. We could learn from Malawi and from a lot of the people who are working on childhood malnutrition around the world. They have these women's care groups. Uh, I think we should call them parent care groups um, in which people just come together and support each other and talk about nutrition and learn about nutrition. So we've always worked well with support groups here in, here in the United States and, and maybe less well with the doctor telling you what to do and more with sharing your experiences about how hard it is to breastfeed or how hard it is to take that bus. And maybe we should have a buying club or just letting people themselves um, brainstorm and vent and share and support each other. Maybe that's a, a movement that you guys can start. Yeah, I think that's that's going to be very helpful. I think, you know, having good community support, good family support um, is going to ultimately make the, the biggest uh, impact. 
Um, I, I do think that this needs to be um, a little bit more of education uh, at the top so it can trickle down. I think that our own physicians here in America aren't really educated um, well enough on nutrition um, and how it impacts our development and our, our health span, really. Um, and if, if our own physicians don't really know um, exactly what's going on or what to be recommending, it's very unlikely that the correct information is going to make itself down to the, the parent and the patient. So uh, I think we need to do a better job in our, in our medical education systems uh, to really get that knowledge out there and not just get it out there, but really, really drive home how important it is and how it's going to affect all of healthcare, um, you know, from top to bottom. I was just going to say that when ready to use therapeutic food first came out, uh, and and this was again this fortified paste that that kind of miraculous, and it could be given in the home. It could be given in the home, and it didn't need refrigeration, it didn't need clean water, and there was a real pushback from the medical community, and this was being like you know turn of this century, 2001, 2002, 2003. And the people who started giving this food medicine, um, they'd be in meetings and other doctors would say, you're killing kids, you know? It's, so the medical community didn't want to give up kind of its control over the situation, mainly because they thought they were doing the right thing. So I think you're right. The medical community often also needs to be educated and to be brought along when there are changes. They're not always, they are sometimes resistant to change. Absolutely. Yeah, can you kind of highlight, so going in, and this is why I love your book because it, it talks about the optimistic side of, there, hey, there is a solution. There's there's an actual light at the end of the tunnel and, the, and it's not far away. So can you kind of talk about the, you know, what has, what's going on right now to actually solve malnutrition and to kind of bring that communication full circle to everybody that needs to be involved? Right. Well, as I, you know, so I think I mentioned we have, we kind of know what to do. We've got the ready to use therapeutic food. We know about the role of vitamins and minerals. We know you need to empower women. You need good sanitation. You need disease. You need et cetera. We've also had, you know, 30 years of strategies, of trying different strategies. School lunch programs and school breakfasts work really well, especially if the food you're buying is from local farmers. Um, and if you uh, get local people to help with that whole program, you kind of empower the whole community. So a nutritious meal twice a day, uh, you know, while a child is in school works. Uh, transfer, cash transfers work really well. Um, you know, health clinics. So, so we, we have programs in place. I will, it, it, I, I was stunned in a way. Last September, the 2021 uh, Food Systems Summit happened. And, you know, got kind of covered up by all the other things that are happening in the world. But the researchers there, the UN a program called GAIN, their, anal their analyst, these are from the World Bank. These are smart people. They, they believe that an extra $33 billion a year for the next 10 years, on top of what we're already doing, could end the majority of hunger in the world not caused by war and conflict. They're not talking just childhood hunger. And this would be improvements to food systems. So this would be um, 33 billion a year improving food systems for the next 10 years. Well, we spend 90 billion a year on our pets and pet products here in America. And I don't mean America has to do this or that America shouldn't love its pets. But the point is the world's a pretty wealthy place. There's really a lot of wealth, a lot of money. So we have the money, we have the programs. I think Kevin has a very good point. We don't always have the education, not even from the top. Um, so we have to, maybe that's what we have to work on most right now. But that is really pretty hopeful. And of course I say that knowing and waking up and reading the news every day, the pandemic, caused more hunger. War will always cause more hunger. But that's that's always been true. Most And most malnourished children are in peaceful countries. So um, I, I, I know we could solve childhood malnutrition. Um, and I just hope we do. And it's not in, you know, kind of based on everything that we now know, it, it took us a long time to get here. But I think oh. that, you know, 
with the right resource allocation and the right the right people communicating, I think that it definitely 100% needs to be within, you know, our lifetime, it needs to be, and, and it can be, you know, soon, you know, within the next 10 years, if we if we all kind of work together to to do this. And that's why, you know, your book is, is inspiring. And, and if you can kind of maybe speak to, I know, you, know, you spoke a little bit in the beginning about what, you know, becoming a mother really helped you understand and want to dive into mm-hmm. this, but speak yeah. to a little bit about of if, if you could have one, one thing that you want people to kind of take away from your book and um, from your work behind this and, and all the hard work you've put in, what would that one takeaway be? Well, I, I do think it would be, we can do this because hope generates action. It's a good strategy. Um, and, um, you know, one of the reasons I, I was inspired to write the book in part was as an environmentalist, because I, uh, mostly I write about nature and science and the environment. And I had so many environmentalist friends who would say, oh, Charmin, I feel bad for those children too. But isn't overpopulation the real problem? And that's a very dated idea. We, we now know that if you want to end population growth, you end extreme poverty. So these were old environmentalists like me. They came of age at a time in the last century when overpopulation was rightfully uh, a concern. But they hadn't moved forward. You know, now I think what I, I guess as an environmentalist, as a person, as a mother, I want to say we're all in this together now. The health of the planet depends on healthy children. As long as we have a quarter of our generation you know, not fulfilling their potential, not able to help us, you know, move forward. Um, That's not good for the health of the planet. Uh, You know, we need to end poverty in order to end overpopulation, which is, um, you know, population growth is still happening in places like Africa. We need, we need healthy children in order to do well in school and, and to be literate and to understand about biodiversity and to understand about our interconnectedness. So I guess I'm finally fumbling towards my final takeaway is that we're, we're connected. We, people and, and animals and plants, uh, we're all connected and we all need to flourish. And we need to be the species that takes care of our children and takes care of our environment and our planet. And that's that's what I want us to be. That's what I think we want to be. We want to be, you know, that that kind of species. Absolutely. Absolutely. Well said. Yeah, no, and I, I would say that um one of the, at some, I read something recently where it said that investing in child in in children in the next generation, especially in childhood nutrition, is one of the best things that we can do as a society because the returns are you know pretty much limitless of what you when you have a healthy child, no matter where they're at in the world, the impact that that healthy child could have on fixing things in the environment and and helping solve all these human problems that that we are facing right now, you know, that's where we should be putting all of our resources into the next generation. Absolutely. So that's really what I, I got from, from your book. And um, okay. I'd love to kind of read something, um, read it, read a, a quote out of your book, which is probably one of my favorite things you put in here. And I think that would be a really good way to, to kind of end our discussion today. But um, you say feeding all of our children begins with the understanding that they are all our children that we are one body on the body of earth and that we are all responsible for what happens on this earth. The next generation of healthy children and adults cannot be separated from a healthy environment and the fight for a healthy environment cannot be separated from the needs and desires of human beings. So thank you. Yeah. Yeah, Thank you so much for for writing this book and for being so passionate and um, for really talking about things that we all need to talk about and for being a leader in the space. So thank you so much for everything you do. I appreciate you, you and your time, and I, I wish we had <laughs> and many more like you. <laughs> well, good luck with all your work, too. Uh, you know, it's we're, it's a collective action, isn't it? We all do what we can. Mm-hmm. Yeah, absolutely. absolutely. Awesome. Yay. <laughs> Thank right. you, Sharon. I appreciate you Thank for you. being here. <laughs> Thank you. Bye-bye. Awesome. <laughs>
To everyone listening, thank you so much for joining us on another episode of Hashtag Food Truth. And if you share our mission for Food Truth, please be sure to rate, review, subscribe, and visit the antiage.org for more helpful tips and information. And remember, don't forget to eat your broccoli.